Well, good morning. Welcome to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research for the launch of our uh, global and UK economic outlooks. Um, uh, they were published um, yesterday. Uh, we had a very successful press conference in trying to explain some of our findings to the press. This is the event to which we look forward to very much every quarter. It's a chance to talk to our peers, uh, fellow economists, about what we've found on the UK and global economy and report back to you. Naturally, in a presentation such as this, there's not a great deal of time to go through all the results that we have. And I very much encourage you all to, to read it if you've got time, both the outlooks, um, and come back to us with any questions or thoughts that you have. One of the wonderful features that we're able to do at NISA is convene a number of experts from around uh, the country and indeed overseas to work with us on aspects of the review, uh, sorry, of the outlooks. And one of the um, uh, important boxes we have on the global economic outlook is an analysis of the SDR issuance by the IMF, which I'm very grateful that Alec Crystal uh, managed to make, make time to write for us uh, when he was released from his duties and examining at the Bayes Business School in London. And he worked closely with one of my colleagues, uh, Kimar White, on that box. As well as that, on the UK, we're gratefully working with uh, Richard Barwell at BNP Paribas to try and ask questions about the Bank of England's communication strategy as we think about what it needs to be doing with the quantum of QE and how it needs to be communicating on the path of interest rates, whether they're going to go negative or at what speed they're going to be normalized. We've lived in this rather odd uh, constraint of the zero lower bound for half a generation now. And I think one of the things we continually ask for is a bit more communication on that. And as well as that, a very critical issue that's going to emerge um, as we come out of the COVID contraction is the rate of firm births. And we're very grateful to our colleagues at Kent, led by Anthony Savaga, to have undertaken some analysis with us of those firm births. And I know that later on we'll be referring to that research in the presentation. So we have a wonderful um, morning ahead. Um, I should say, particularly after I finish my opening remarks, um, I will turn to Dr. Handy Kichuk to talk about the global economic outlook. Then Rory McQueen will talk about the UK macro outlook. Cyril uh, Linoel um, has undertaken some really impressive work on analysing se sectoral implications of the shock and the recovery work that is relatively rarely done in the UK. And we're very glad to resurrect that at the Institute. And of course, another example of our ability to convene and step outside the Institute is that we've brought in um, Arnab Bhattacharji from the University of um, uh, Harriet Watt, Harriet Watt University, to work with us on developing our regional outlooks and constructing that into a regional model called NIREMS, which is now fitting with NIGEM to give us a, 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 an analysis of the micro underpinnings of the macro picture that we're presenting. The two are, in a sense, talking to each other. For every macro story, there's a household, regional, sectoral story, as well as in the devolved nations. And we think that's going to be very much uh, the story of the British economy as we come out of recovery. But as we hear about the global economy as well, there is considerable heterogeneity there, both in the euro area and um, in, in emerging economies. So the aggregate is nothing more than a starting remark. Um, I, I don't want to uh, spend much more and take that much more time away from the main presenters here this morning. Uh, but if I could quickly go through some key points. Um, we know these are difficult times. I've already talked about um, the extent to which there's heterogeneity in outcomes. And all of these, I think, have exposed the things that we teach in economics um, about the coordination of different arms of monetary and fiscal policy, whether one should dominate the other, what are the targets, particularly a problem for fiscal policy. Nobody really knows what we're trying to aim for. There's a whole range of instruments at disposable and they're relatively poorly explained. Um, and we need to move to a world in which those, those, those fiscal interventions, economic policy itself is much better planned and purpose towards a social welfare criterion. Our overall view on the global economy is summarized in our global economic outlook. Um, and uh, there's a short summary of it on the next slide. Um, and we've called our global economic outlook our vaccine debt. And that's sort of play on words really there. We are obviously in debt to the people who developed the vaccine. 
but also at the same time as we come out of COVID, we're going to find even if we regain our pre-2020 uh, level of output, we're going to have lost output in that process. For example, we estimate that world output in 2025 is going to be some 4% lower than our pre-pandemic expectations. That is a world that is not in economic terms as large as we would have anticipated. And yet, even if we get back to those levels eventually, we live in a world of higher public debt, higher private debt, unemployment, asset prices, which are, let me say, fragile rather than anything else, um, and macroeconomic stabilization, because of what it's had to do in the last decade or so seems incre increasingly vulnerable to the next crisis. I've already talked about heterogeneity. And there are severe question marks, which are answered to some degree with with successful issuance, we think, of the SDRs. But there's clearly some things that need to be addressed in the global financial architecture in respect of how we manage the vaccines, climate change, and even fiscal policy. Is there a case for more in certain countries? Um, in terms of the UK, yes, there is brisk growth this year, but it's, it doesn't look better at the moment. We look forward to hearing what's in the Queen's speech a little bit later on. Uh, we're surprised that it hasn't all been leaked already which is certainly what happened at the time of the budget, or not all, but a lot of it. And uh, we look forward to hearing what's in there. But critical issues are the extent to which forced savings are, are, are drawn down or not. And also the continuing exposure of the UK service sector to the virus or its mutants and the potential Brexit related drag on economic growth as trade is crimped. The large output fall last year exposed uh, structural problems in the UK economy uh, that I think need to be addressed with the scarring we talk about in the rest of the world applies to the UK as well. And I know later on that Arna will be talking about the extent to which the crisis has exposed extreme outcomes for those in low income areas. So let me now turn to Handa Kachuk, who will go through our global economic outlook. Handa. Thank you very much, Jagjit. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. I'm Hande Küçük, Deputy Director for Macroeconomics at NISE. And today, um, I'm pleased to present the main themes from, uh, from the spring issue of our Global Economic Outlook, prepared uh, by my colleague, Beri Nesbit, who is in the panel with me today, and my other colleagues whose names are on the slide. So as always, we use our global macroeconometric model, NIJAM, to prepare these forecasts and related analysis. Let me start with some headlines on short-term economic outlook. Uh, we have now revised our projection for global GDP growth this year from 4.5% to 5.5%. And with growth next year at four and a quarter, uh, the two years of growth will mark the strongest global growth since 2010-11. Uh, we now expect higher inflation, slightly higher inflation. OECD inflation is forecast to rise to 3% uh, this year uh, from 1.6% last year. And inflation we projected to be at 2.5% next year. So these are a uh, half point percentage point increases compared to our uh, last forecast round. Despite the more positive growth projections, uh, economic outlook remains uncertain due to the ongoing pandemic. There are three major factors that lie behind our upward GDP growth revision. The first is the increased economic resilience in the face of recent waves of the virus. We have also observed faster than expected vaccination rollouts and the US fiscal stimulus was a big game changer. So I'll come to these in the next slides. Um, we have seen increased cases in Europe, uh, Latin America, and most recently and dr dramatically in India, as you can see from this chart. And the uh, uh, recent waves have been unfortunately more deadly, uh, as you can see, and brought about new restrictions and lockdowns. But as the next slide shows, uh, there have been increased resilience despite new pandemic waves. So there have been new lockdowns. They were less severe in extent in most countries, uh, but still, um, we see uh, it's not only about uh, less severe uh, lockdowns, but also um, some uh, adjustment of the economies uh, to the pandemic and the lockdown. So we can see that um, the growth rates in most countries, in all countries, in 
the last quarter of last year and Q1 this year have been nowhere close to the falls uh, that we observed in the second quarter of last year. And as the next slide shows, the economic experiences of uh, countries have been quite divergent. This chart simply shows where we expect economies to be compared to their pre-pandemic levels by the end of this year. So this um, difference, this uh, differs between uh, minus nine in Spain to plus eight in China, uh, and many factors uh, are at play in explaining this divergence, including exposure to the pandemic, you know, structural uh, properties of the economies before the pandemic, um, the monthly fiscal space, but we see that divergence is an important theme in the global economic outlook. The second uh, factor that uh, led to a revision in our forecast is the progression in vaccinations. So compared to uh, our um, previous forecast round, we have seen that most countries have increased their vaccination rates. Um, again, with some countries like the US and UK uh, having advanced uh, much more and the uh, differences uh, in access to vaccine is also quite striking and it requires the need for global cooperation because as we have said before, uh, no one is safe until all of us are safe. So these uh, divergences highlight that uh, importance of the vaccine rollout. So uh, as a response to the pandemic, many countries have responded mainly through fiscal policy, and this was more prevalent in advanced economies. Uh, debt to GDP ratios in advanced economies have risen by 15 to 20 percentage points, uh, an increase of around $7 trillion. It's a massive amount of support. And this brings us uh, to our third theme uh, this forecast round, which is the massive US fiscal stimulus, which uh, is also behind this recent rise in the projected rise in the debt to GDP ratio. So in the next slide, um, we um, show our um, baseline estimates of the effects of the American rescue plan on the US economy and the rest of the world. In this global economic outlook, we have looked at this issue in great detail. We have two topical futures uh, that use NIJAM uh, to analyze different dimensions of the issue. So here it's the uh, standard simulation, which um, focuses mostly on the trade channel and uh, using the standard uh, estimates, uh, standard fiscal multiplier estimates based on uh, the model, we estimate that the 1.9 trillion fiscal uh, stimulus will boost US economic growth by around three percentage point this year, as you can see on the left-hand side of the chart, and it will have important effects for growth next year as well. And uh, focusing mostly on the trade channel, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side, we expect it to add around one percentage point to global GDP growth, uh, excluding the US and uh, in the standard simulation that focuses on the trade, we expect the spillovers to be around the same in EMs, emerging markets and advanced economies. But as I stress in the next slide, these might change depending on how we see different channels. So in our topical futures, uh, we uh, look at some different transmission channels. First of all, we consider an alternative scenario where a greater share of income constrained households and firms are present due to the downturn. So this scenario helps us to consider a case where the fiscal multipliers could be higher than the uh, historical leverages. And the second uh, scenario, uh, we look at a case where monetary policy could tighten earlier than expected given uh, considerations about inflation. So in the standard uh, simulations, we, don't, we leave the monetary stance unchanged given the recent um, shift in US monetary policy strategy to average inflation targeting. But in a second scenario, we look what happens if the Fed tightens earlier than expected. In a third case, we consider a term premium shock to reflect the recent experience in the US term, uh, US uh, long term yields to see how that increase in long term interest rates might take away from uh, the uh, effect on uh, from the stimulatory effect of the fiscal stimulus. And as a separate topical future, we put to focus uh, financial spillovers to emerging markets. We consider a case where we calibrate some risk premium shocks based on the uh, previous taper tantrum episode in 2013. 
So let me go very briefly uh, over these scenarios. So this chart shows you the impact on US GDP uh, under alternative scenarios. So the standard scenarios in both charts are shown by the red bars. But on the left-hand side chart, you can see that if we have um, doubled, um, uh, if, if the income constraints, uh, if the share of households and firms that face income constraints are doubled compared to the standard model, which is the medium constraints, we see we can see much larger uh, impacts on US GDP in the first year. So if we consider uh, more severe income constraints, the effects on US GDP could be even uh, double. Uh, that in the standard scenario coming close to almost six percentage points. The differences uh, could, would be smaller in year two because of rising inflation and its effects on this, um, lowering real disposable income, but the first year range is quite large given, uh, you know, how, uh, given the sensitivity of consumption to, to income. Uh, on the right hand side, we show how the standard estimates could change if the US uh, interest rate tightens earlier. These are the gray bars. And you can see that the changes are smaller because we don't, even if the policy is active, uh, we don't expect a large increase in interest rates, but the differences are uh, increased in the second year due to lagged effects of uh, monetary policy. And on the next slide, uh, I mentioned uh, the second topical future, which is about modeling financial spillovers to emerging markets. So our standard uh, estimates focus mostly on the trade channel, as I mentioned. So all of the emerging markets that are considered in our analysis are expected to uh, be affected positively by the trade uh, channel, which are shown by the red bars. So if we expect positive spillovers to all of them, but we might see uh, some negative spillovers from uh, higher long rates uh, in the US spilling over to emerging markets as higher uh, as depreciated currencies and tighter domestic financial conditions. And this could be even more severe if the rise in the US long yield is sustained and if it brings about a rise in global risk aversion, which might imply, which could uh, uh, have consequences on exchange rate interest rates close to what we observed in the taper tantrum. So if this is the case, you can see that the net effect from the fiscal uh, stimulus could be actually negative. So the financial effects could um, offset the uh, positive trade spillovers for countries which have high uh, country risk premia, such as Turkey, Argentina, and Brazil. So coming uh, from our topical futures back to our uh, main case scenario on global GDP growth, for this year and the next, we expect all major economies to grow. So our main case is for US, US GDP to grow by 6.5% this year, Euro area to grow by 4.2 this year. The growth rates will be are expected to slow down next year, but we still expect growth in most major economies uh, next year. So the GDP growth will diverge across countries and across country groups. And this will have effects on the long-term effects of uh, the pandemic, as I show in the next slide. So there will be scarring effects on GDP of COVID. In, uh, as Jadjit mentioned, in 2025, we project global GDP to be 4% lower than expected before the pandemic. And this will be uh, different across advanced and emerging economies. Emerging economies have had uh, less uh, ability to stimulate through monetary and fiscal policy, most of them, and they, some of them are facing uh, resource constraints in accessing the vaccines and fighting the pandemic. So this is reflected as a higher long-term scarring for emerging market economies in our main case scenario. Of course, there are substantial risks around our main case GDP scenarios. Uh, there are further waves, there could be further waves of the virus, mutations of the virus. Uh, there are questions about vaccine effectiveness in the face of uh, virus mutations. There is need for a global coordination in vaccine rollout. Some countries are really falling behind uh, vaccine rollouts and uh, we need to have the global recovery sustained. Uh, we need a global effort to distribute vaccines more evenly uh, across economies. And, um, I haven't had time to mention, but our topical futures also 
uh, mention uh, possible inflation risk um, from running the US economy hot. And these might um, make that negative financial spillover scenario uh, more, more likely. Um, so these are downside risks on the global economy as well. And another negative shock could test monetary and fiscal policy space for action. So as Jagjit already mentioned, in most countries, um, rates are already close to uh, zero lower bound and uh, public debt as at unprecedented levels. So another shock might leave questions about, fiscal, uh, about policy space. Finally, uh, before uh, giving word to my uh, colleague Rory, I wanted to have mentioned to you uh, what, what's recently going on in our modeling front, in our model in NIJAM. So I wanted to bring to your attention our recent topical features, the last two I've already mentioned. So I encourage you to check the outlook to read more about how we think about modeling uh, US fiscal stimulus. Uh, and I also wanted to remind you of our recent work on the effects of uh, vaccine distribution across the world and our views on how the change in the monetary policy framework of the US, how the shift to average inflation targeting uh, could impact the macroeconomic outlook. And I also wanted to bring to your attention the recent changes uh, in our climate module in NIJAM. Now we have developed, we have a, a quite developed module that works with NIJAM, which allows us to study macro implications of uh, physical and transition shocks related to climate change. And NIJAM is used as a part of the uh, network for greening the financial system modeling consortium. So we'll, which will um, publish uh, their scenarios closely. So our climate model has been used uh, in, in the production of these. And we are also involved with the United Nations Environmental Program uh, Financial Initiative uh, to think about designing scenarios uh, for stress testing in the financial uh, sector. So it's a, a small digression. After this, uh, we encourage you to uh, check our website to see the subscription options. So by subscribing, you can have access to our global economic outlooks and the topical features, as well as our uh, modeling tools. So I'd like to uh, thank you for listening and give the word to my colleague, Rory McQueen, who will talk about the UK economic outlook. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as you can see there, this is work done by myself and Cyril with Hander, our Deputy Director. Uh, our headline, which you've probably already seen, is for economic growth in the UK at 5.7% this year, which is a revision up from 3.4% in February. We're looking at 4.5% next year, and we forecast a peak of unemployment at the end of this year at 6.5%, which is a bit lower than we had in our February forecast. We're also going to cover the fact that the UK's relatively poor performance in terms of the pandemic and the aftermath will have a, a permanent cost in relation to other major economies. On the left, you can see how the adaptation of the UK economy to lockdown has meant that the correlation between activity and mobility is a lot weaker than it was last year, uh, when mobility provided quite a good useful indicator for what's happening to GDP very quickly. The second lockdown or the, the current full national lockdown uh, is actually really quite concentrated in terms of its effects in certain sectors. And we also have had the case numbers falling thanks to the lockdown and a very successful vaccination program. And that's taken into consideration with what you can see on the left there, suggests to us a much smaller drop in first quarter than we'd anticipated in February. We're looking at probably minus 1.6 and we'll get some figures out tomorrow from the ONS. Uh, we're expecting forecast 4.4% in the second quarter, driven by the reopening of certain sectors which closed down. And we're also revising up our outlook because of government spending, which both provides support to the private sector and contributes directly to GDP. That was announced at the budget in March. On the left, you can see our GDP fan chart, which gives some idea of the uncertainty around it. I'll come back to talk about some of those things uh, shortly. We return to pre-pandemic levels of GDP in the UK at the end of 2022. In the long term, as you see on the right, we're about 4% lower in level terms compared with our November 2019 forecast, the last one before COVID broke out in China. Uh, that isn't entirely... Um, that can't be entirely put down to COVID because we've also changed our Brexit assumptions 
uh, during that period as well. In terms of downside and upside risks, um, just before I come on to the inflation slide, the uh, downside, we are looking, as Anders mentioned, the global spread of the virus, and uh, there's a big question mark over the forced savings issue, which I'll mention in a moment. On inflation, we're looking at probably 1.8% at the end of this year. Uh, it'll be around there for the first half of next year and then fall back to 1.5% by the end of next year as some of these temporary factors dissipate. We've got some base effects in the coming months as well. There's an upside risk to inflation, which comes from the two-speed recovery we discuss in detail in the UK economic outlook. We could see a situation in the coming months and even years where some households that have built up savings are spending freely with a lot of pent up demand, while at the same time, the bank could be reluctant to raise rates if unemployment is still high in the sectors which have been badly affected by the pandemic. We don't, by the way, uh, account for that in our central case scenario. That is, as I said, an upside risk to inflation. So uh, moving on, uh, you can see in the left-hand slide our assumption for the household savings ratio and we're expecting 5.9% consumption growth this year. Mostly that's down to stronger forecasts for income. Uh, from 2023, as you can see, the savings rate returns to around 9%, which is just slightly above the historical average. It's notably above the level that we saw between the Brexit referendum and the COVID pandemic. Uh, there's obviously enormous uncertainty around that. We know that something in the region of 160 billion pounds probably of forced savings as people are calling them have accumulated predominantly to wealthier households during the pandemic um, on the right you can see some of the alternative scenarios which cyril my colleague has worked on in particular with our nigem model i won't go through them all in detail but you can see how if one is more optimistic if you like about people spending those savings we could see GDP up to two or three percent higher in a year's time. On the other hand, if people are very cautious about their savings ratio, about their savings behaviour after the pandemic, perhaps because there's major global further outbreaks, we could be looking at four percent lower. There's just enormous uncertainty around this. And what you can see here on the left is some research by the Health Foundation, um, which speaks to the fact that the UK in terms of its health and social care infrastructure was not particularly well prepared going into the pandemic. What we argue is that when the UK had a very large fall, the largest in the G7 last year, although part of that was down to the measurement of public sector output and our social consumption share, part of that was just down to the fact that we had a very bad case of COVID-19 in the UK. And if it's the case, as Health Foundation argue, that some of um, the mortality rates were exacerbated by a lack of investment beforehand. It could be argued that some of the economic cost uh, arose due to underinvestment before the pandemic. If you look on the right, you can see the fact that the pandemic has led to a falling behind compared to other leading economies. The red bars indicate our forecasts for the US, Germany and UK before the pandemic. The black bars are the current forecasts. You can see that this takes into account both how the pandemic went in each of those countries and the planned recovery policies which come afterwards in each of them. Obviously the US stimulus on the left has been spoken about already, but you can clearly see how GDP per capita is expected to be much lower in the UK relative to those countries than it was before the pandemic. Firms have seen very heterogeneous uh, effects. Some have sailed through perhaps even picked up cheap finance. Others have been devastated, have closed or just about survived through to high debt. Uh, in terms of demand for labour, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at a peak of 6.5% for unemployment rather than 7.5% in February. This is compatible with um, probably around 450,000 of the people being furloughed at the moment, losing their jobs when that comes to an end. And Cyril will speak about a bit more about how that pans out across sectors. On the right, you see the prospects for investment. Um, which is forecast to rise 9% overall the year, a lot of that down to housing, as you can see. And I'll come on briefly, probably most of you have seen graphs like this over the last year. This is an indication of how public sector net debt in red bars has risen since the start of the pandemic. Uh, 
we forecast it to peak 104% of GDP next year. And the black bars show the rise in the Bank of England's quantitative easing scheme. Uh, 450 billion pounds of new QE has been authorised since the start of the pandemic. The government has faced perhaps unsurprisingly no financing problems with raising this new debt over the last year. This is obviously part of the picture. And so I'll finish by just talking about some of the analysis we've done regarding the sensitivity of this new debt or government debt overall, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, interest rate rises. So what we have here is a, a table from the Office of Budget Responsibility in February, sorry, March. You can see uh, the numbers, particularly in the second row, you see this uh, elevated sensitivity to an increase in short rates. Obviously, higher debt will always mean increased sensitivity to some rate rises, but this, the unusual situation we have here is obviously the QE is effectively refinanced a big chunk of government debt at floating rate, at bank rate. You can see that this was raised by the OBR and by the Chancellor in March. But what really matters about the sensitivity of government debt and the sustainability of government debt uh, in terms of interest rates is why rates rise. So we've modelled with NIGEM two scenarios, the first of which is what some people might think is more likely is a, a fast demand recovery. So households spend more quickly. As you can see on the right, the bank rate rises by around one percentage point uh, higher than the baseline throughout the next five years. That feeds through to long rates. And we also model scenario two, which is perhaps some loss of faith in the UK government that sees gilt yields rise. As you can see on the right, a rise in the long-term rate without a rise in the bank rate. Indeed, you see a small cut in bank rates as the Bank of England tries to offset the effect. So these are, if you like, two potential sources of interest rate rises. And we model these to begin with, with a model that doesn't include QE. On the next slide, you can see in red, the effect on public sector borrowing in scenario one, which although interest rates have gone up, public sector borrowing clearly goes down as naturally you'd expect in a consumption boom, there's a lot more tax coming in, uh, debt can be repaid more quickly, there's lower transfers to households. So on the right, you see that there's an increasing share of interest payments, share of GDP, but despite that, the public sector is clearly better off uh, in scenario one, despite rising interest rates. Uh, in, in black, you can see that's not the case for a situation where guilt rates rise not down to some sort of consumption boom raising bank rate but um, because of loss of faith in the government and just to remind you i say that there are this is this is one percentage point higher rates across the whole forecast period but then we take into account the qe effect which you can see here on the left in the case of scenario one the shaded sort of pink color which works to offset the fiscal windfall for the government because it has to pay higher bank rates on the qe reserves we maintain the assumption that QE reserves are unchanged because that's what's in the, um, the, the OBR. We stick to the OBR assumptions in the table I showed you at the start. And as you can see, the net fiscal impact of a demand boost is actually very slightly negative on the government now if all of that QE stock is retained throughout that period, which is a strong assumption I'll come on to in a sec. On the right, you see a clear uh, rise in public borrowing obviously as um, interest rate rise and as, uh, interest rates go up and QE has very little effect on that effect it's, it's very slightly positive so coming back to that original table you can see in scenario one which i think many people are concerned about a, a rise in demand interest rate rise is happening very quickly there is a rise in 20 billion in interest rate payments but that's um uh, that is just working to some degree to offset naturally be a fiscal windfall for the government. This doesn't, by the way, mean that QE is uh, costing the government money. It remains a large net fiscal benefit, transferred over 100 billion over the past 10 years to the government. And actually, what's more likely if we saw anything like this would be the fact that the Bank of England may unwind its QE holdings. <coughs> They're currently reviewing the, the, the process and timetable for doing so. Or, and this has been discussed in other work, which we can 
discuss if anyone's interested or um, elsewhere, work done by NISA colleagues on alternatives to the regime on which interest is paid on reserves, uh, which could be the case. And it's certainly useful to, if we were to have some clarity, perhaps from policymakers about whether they deem that necessary, and what some of the alternatives might be. But in summary, if there are concerns, they're probably still more around guilt rates and the classic sensitivity of government debt to that than any um, worry around QE because there are things that we can do to deal with it. So I'll leave you with a summary of the UK forecast in front of you. Thank you for your time. And I'll hand over to my colleague Cyril Lenoir. Thank you very much, Bowie. Um... So I will de uh, go in a bit more details in uh, the sectors uh, of the of our UK outlook. Um, so it's the first, it's the second time we do, do uh, an in-depth analysis uh, of the sectors. Um, so while the first national lockdown hit the whole economy, uh, subsequent lockdowns affected mainly the private non-trading uh, sector. Um, the successful vaccination program uh, and the return of consumer confidence is expected to lead to a positive consumption shock uh, starting um, in the second quarter of this year. Um, but the employment picture is still worrisome um, after the furlough scheme ends. So in the next slide, uh, I'm showing you um, the, how um, the different sectors are expected to grow in 2021. Uh, so that's the vertical axis compared to how much um, they declined in 2020. So that's the horizontal axis. Um, and uh, the size of the bubble corresponds to the weight of uh, the sector in total GBA. Uh, so what you can see is that the, uh, the construction and public sector on, on the, um, uh, that are close to the line uh, are expected to, uh, to go back relatively quickly to their uh, pre-pandemic level, uh, in particular with you know, uh, 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 good, uh, very good numbers recently in construction. Um, but most other sectors, and in particular uh, services and manufacturing, uh, are expected to, to lag behind uh, in the recovery. Um, and uh, on the left hand side, you've got the uh, private non traded services sector, which is uh, made up uh, of um, things like retail, um, accommodation, and food. Um, and it's quite a large sector that's uh, expected to grow uh, by around 9% next year. And so it will drive uh, uh, a significant share of the recovery this year. Um, so turning to the next slide, um, <clears throat> I'm showing you here the, uh, how the employment picture is quite different from the uh, output picture. So um, the, the four charts uh, here show you um, employment uh, in the different sectors. So that's the red line. Um, and employment uh, to which we remove the number of people in furlough. So that's the black line. Um, and so the, 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 the sort of the larger the area between the black and the red line, um, the higher the share of, of uh, people in furlough in this sector. Um, and um, so what you can see is that um, while, um, while uh, there is a recovery in output and uh, employment excluding furlough is, is going to increase, uh, employment in the sector is still decreasing and that's because um, people uh, are expected, uh, companies are expected to respond to the recovery in activity by reducing the number of followed employees rather than uh, hiring new employees. Um, so the, uh, the, the, if you go back, yes, thank you. Um, the, um, the number of followed is expected to go from uh, around 4.3 million uh, to uh, gradually to zero in the fourth quarter when the follow schemes end. And, uh, and below, I'm giving you some, uh, some of the numbers of how much um, uh, em employment is going to be lost in a few selected sectors. One of the exceptions being construction, where um, uh, the sector is actually expected to create jobs uh, this year. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let me now turn to uh, a simulation we've done. Um, so that's uh, to look at um, how um, a 1% touch point drop in, uh, in GDP focused on the social, on social consumption. So, um, so that's everything that in the private non-traded services sector um, and how it's gonna expect to spill over into different sectors. 
Uh, so for that purpose, we use our um, newly developed uh, National Institute sectoral econometric model, um, which disaggregates the UK uh, macro forecast into nine industrial sectors uh, linked by input output and output expenditure relationships. <clears throat> and so the figure on the left uh, shows you that if the, if the shock is concentrated in private non-traded services, um, then it's expected to, uh, to spill over uh, to other sectors and in particular um, manufacturing and private traded services are, uh, are the sectors that would uh, decline most as, as a result of uh, essentially inputs uh, uh, from the non-traded services being lower um, and, and therefore they, they would have lower output as well. Um, and on, on the right hand side, uh, it shows you that the, um, in terms of employment, um, there, there would be um, a reallocation of labor from, um, from, from the uh, non-traded services sector uh, to, to the other sectors, meaning that after three years, uh, total employment would be unchanged, um, but uh, the, with the private non-traded services sector losing uh, jobs towards uh, other sectors. And um, while construction is quite a small sector, as, as a share, it would have um, the highest increase in uh, employment. <clears throat> so turning to, to the next slide, um, um, I'm showing you here this, uh, uh, why, why this sort of simulation is particularly relevant in our case, so in um, in the first in the second quarter of this year, we expect uh, non-traded services output to increase by um, around twenty-two percent. Uh, so that's nearly uh, three point nine percent of GDP. Um, so so that means that most of the uh, uh, recovery in this uh, in GDP in the second quarter will come from this sector. Um, and based on our simulation, if, if you sort of assume a positive shock rather than a negative shock um, and assume some symmetry, then uh, it means we expect positive spillovers uh, to output in sectors like manufacturing and private traded services. Um, but the, uh, in terms of employment, there would be very limited spillovers um, because of the sort of related reallocation. Um, and therefore, um, that's why we, we focus on employment rising after um, the, the end of the furlough scheme and to peak at, uh, at around six and a half percent. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And um, let me now um, hand over to Professor Anna uh, Betatachi, uh, who is uh, an ESA fellow and also professor at the University of Harriet Watt. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, uh, good, good morning, everyone. In uh, February uh, 2021, we brought to you an ambitious and uh, innovative uh, uh, new initiative, the National Institute's very own Regional Modeling System NIRAMS. Uh, the development of NIRAMS is ongoing. Uh, in this particular uh, uh, outlook, we also build in quite a lot of inter-regional relationships spillovers and so on. And uh, the network map uh, on the right hand side shows how we do that. We can go into further details if uh, um, there are questions. But anyway, what this points out is to the fact that the devolved nations are further uh, moved away from London. So there's no direct links and the network structure is fairly weak. And that has implications for uh, regional uh, outcomes in, in the UK. What we also do is uh, we model inactivity and unemployment rates together. Uh, so the entire decomposition of the labor force is something that we have started modeling and that provides very nuanced analysis. We do this by region, age and household demographics to obtain a better sense of deprivation and, and uh, bad outcomes in terms of poverty and unemployment across the households. In the next slide, uh, the broad outlines are uh, um, given. So there is growing socioeconomic disparities across the UK's uh, nations and uh, regions. The important thing is that we see no return to pre-pandemic levels of um, economic output before 2023 Q2. This is on the back of somewhat uneven progress on uh, Brexit and uh, uh, the budget also indicating that welfare measures for 
example, the furlough scheme and the enhanced allotments or allocations from universal credit will come to an end very soon. We find that unemployment recovers relatively slowly, except for London, which is a special case, and we are going to talk about London uh, a, a bit more uh, as we go forward. The most alarming uh, bit that we find is a huge rise in youth unemployment, and that drives destitution in Scotland and the North, and also the Southeast, interestingly. What is also important is that we find large child food poverty as well. So in terms of gross value added, we find that there is widespread scurrying uh, across the regions and uh, across, uh, this, is, this is true across all the major indicators, gross value added employment and productivity. Uh, the chapter contains a lot of details. Here we can see that across all regions, there is still sharply reduced gross value added in the current quarter relative to the end of 2019, the only exception being East Midlands. Across all other regions, recovery to 2019 levels will take up to mid 2023. That is very slow pace of recovery. In the next slide, we'll see uh, employment across the UK regions. The important thing here to notice is the, uh, the somewhat divergent pattern in Northern Ireland. Employment in Northern Ireland is going to recover very slowly compared to the other uh, devolved nations, or compared to the nations, other nations of the United Kingdom. Similar divergence is also projected for region clusters in England on the next slide. As you can see that London is the big winner here. Uh, and uh, you know, so there, there's wide, wide disparity across the uh, different uh, uh, region clusters. Weathering a deep later this year, more jobs are projected in London for the following three years. This is in line with also with new form uh, formation on which we have a nice box in the outlook. What we also do, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we look at these unemployment trends against the context of dynamics of job seeking and matching, as highlighted by economic inactivity and unemployment rates. Unemployment rates are projected to sharply rise in all regions in 21, 22, and further in 22, 23, as the furlough scheme is withdrawn. As the higher and rising participation rate is not matched by job creation and vacancy feelings, the unemployment rate in London is projected to be the highest in the UK and reducing only slowly. Elsewhere, there is a lower rise in unemployment, but the pace of recovery is almost equally slow, as well inactivity rates are much higher. Labor productivity also paints a very grim picture. We find that recovery to 2019 Q4 levels only happens about 2024 Q4. That is a very long and slow recovery back to what the pre-pandemic levels. However, what is also observed here is that the productivity in London is much higher than the rest of the uh, United Kingdom. If we look at uh, destitution uh, uh, patterns on the next slide, um, uh, destitution is projected to rise sharply uh, in all the devolved nations, but also in the north of England and the south and east. In particular, there is very high child food poverty, especially for single uh, adult households. There's continued unemployment and loss of low wage jobs. And this is particularly very acute for young people between 18 and 24 years old, also for 25 to 49. So th th there are uh, important strains coming forward. In terms of policy, on the next slide, we uh, suggest uh, continued universal credit and school meals and welfare programs more generally, alignment of jobs to skills, uh, retraining, including retraining and labor market interventions, but most importantly, also leveling up of transport connectivity and infrastructure, which can provide long-term growth opportunities and leveling up opportunities across the United Kingdom. The important thing is to have a more robust fiscal framework and joint up policy approach. In summary, we find continued 
the, the, the deprivation and severe negative consequences as a result of COVID and Brexit shocks. There are large regional variations and concentration of destitution. This needs strong and sustained welfare and regional policy in the short run. Regional transfers and benefit payments is what we suggest. In the long run, there has to be careful planning based on evidence which now NIREMS is able to provide and uh, we, we can provide further insights in this respect. Thank you very much. Uh, much more details are available in the Outlook itself. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Anna, Cyril, Rory, um, Handa, for some excellent uh, presentations there. As you can tell, we've got um, a lot of rich points to make and it, it's so, uh, difficult for us to make them all in the time available, but I would encourage you to get hold of the copies of our recent reports, the UK Economic Outlook, the Global Economic Outlook, and our work uh, published the week before last on the new fiscal framework, which has, amongst amongst others, contributions from Norman Lamont and Alistair Darling, um, and a rather nice picture of Rishi Sunak, which we managed to uh, get him to pose um, for us in that picture there you can see on the front. So do, do, um, do read those for more detail. So what we see this as is really an introduction to the issues more than anything else. We have a number of questions coming in. Um, as I've warned, we're probably going to go slightly over the hour, maybe till about five minutes past. I hope you can stay with us so we can answer the questions that have come in. Can I first turn to a couple of questions on the global outlook? And I'd like to introduce again, Barry Nesbitt, who's very much been responsible for coordination of the global economic outlook, and also Adrian Pabst, our Deputy Director for Social Policy and Political Economy, who um, have also joined uh, the panel for this moment. On the global uh, question, we have a question from uh, Tim Butcher at the Low Pay Commission and uh, Gary Dimsky at uh, Leeds, um, which is going to be in receipt of a large number of government jobs, uh, we hope, Leeds, uh, Leeds University, I should say. And two aspects of the question, which I think are related, this question about when the world economy recovers its previous level and what kind of state it's in as a result of that, it's not only the level, it's how much we've lost in the interim. And I know, Barry, you and I and the team have had many conversations on those, along those lines over the last few months. And then also, how did we factor in um, a, a revised view on countries such as India with the devastating pictures that are coming over, uh, over from there as a result of the COVID crisis? So I wonder if you could just add a bit of, of colour to our hard numbers in terms of how we're thinking about these things, Barry. Yeah, sure, Jagdeer. Thanks. And thanks for the questions. I'll, I'll try and be brief. Mm. So in terms of the level of GDP, if you uh, go back and have a look at the global economic outlook, you'll see actually got two charts in there on that, figures one and figures 10. So figure one looks at the global the level of GDP, where, I mean, we make the point that by 20, that in 2025, the level of GDP will be around 4% lower than we had expected it to be before the crisis hit. That's um, worth a, about six and a half trillion dollars. Um, so it, it's not small change. And um, more to the point, perhaps, if, if one looks at the fact that one's lost the level of GDP in each of the years leading up to 2025, relative to where we thought, then the, the cumulative loss is somewhere around 36 trillion. Um, to the point of when do we get back? Well, globally, we're nearly there. Um, we're at, at Q1, we reckon we're only about a quarter of a percent shy of the end of 2019 Q4. So um, probably get there in Q2. And China's already there and already surpassed its uh, level at end uh, 2019. Um, the US will probably get there in Q2. Um, amongst the laggards, obviously the UK, which we which we'll cover in the UK presentation, but also the Euro area, and in, within the Euro area, probably um, Italy and Spain are the the relative laggards, not expected to get regain their 2019 Q4 levels till 2023. So that gives you some idea of the context. Um, in terms of uh, the second point about India, which is I I think a really interesting one, but I have to admit. Um, probably at the moment one of the most difficult ones to try and get a hold of. Um, one of the questions that I, I hope someone would ask was be, why was the IMF so much more optimistic than we are on our global economic growth? And part of the answer to that is India. So in PPP weighted terms, India's around 7% of the global economy. 
IMF's forecasting growth around 12.5% this year. We've got growth of 8%. So that, that's about a quarter of a percentage point difference on global economic growth from our view on India to the IMF's. Um, are we going to be right on 8% growth? Well, it'd be nice to think so, but it clearly is a very difficult situation to try and forecast at the moment. Um, if I look back last year, India had a fall of 25% in its GDP in the second quarter, but at the end of the year, it was only down about 7%. So if the outbreak, um, serious and horrifying as it is, is, proves to be relatively short-lived, we could see, as we did last year, another bounce back in the Indian economy, which leaves me thinking that a, a positive number for the year as a whole is a, a good shot at a, at a reasonable forecast. I hope that answers both those questions and also ties them together for you. Thank you, Barry. Excellent, as ever. Um, Simon is short. I'm going to run to Adrian Paps. Really, I had a question from Leonard Schweizer, really, uh, from Germany, um, just about how we can build back better and whether we can. And I think that also relates to the final question from Ying Jin at Cambridge on, on why we have such low growth in the regions. Adrian, I, I, I know you have some views on how fiscal policy can help in that. And that, indeed, that question was referred to um, by Leonard and also by Chris Longley at the Institution of uh, Civil Engineers, really about how we can do what we can do to improve GVA or productivity um, in the regions and build back better. Adrian, do you want to come back on that briefly? Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Jagjit, and thanks for the uh, excellent questions. Uh, maybe just very briefly to go into the reasons of why the regions are lagging behind London and the southeast. And my, my colleague Arnab has already mentioned some of them, but just to summarize, uh, it is to do with um, loss of jobs and, and rising unemployment, uh, which hits uh, especially those regions where lockdown has had a bigger effect or indeed uh, Brexit related trade disruptions. It is to do uh, also with the lack of firm births and the fact that firm creation is not happening uh, you know, in a uniform way across the country at all, just the contrary. Uh, and then the third reason is to do with investment. Investment is not spread uh, equally at all. Again, it's heavily concentrated. And so what needs to happen is precisely to address those three questions. So we need labor market intervention when furlough comes to an end. That means retraining and other things so that you know, we don't have higher unemployment than we're already projecting. Uh, because, of course, with, un with unemployment comes loss of activity, uh, skills atrophy, and so on. We need to tackle the question of investment, which means both public investment. The National Infrastructure Bank has been given $12 billion, That's a drop in the ocean. We need to get more money uh, for large investment projects, but also, of course, help the private sector. And that means finance, making finance accessible to small and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises ar around the, uh, the devolved nations and regions. And then I think we also need... Uh, to think very hard about some of the bigger infrastructure uh, projects like uh, HS2 and so on. Is that really the best way or do we need to think more about uh, transport connectivity, uh, you know, cross country rather than, you know, from London to the, to, the, to the provinces as it were. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, we have a set of questions that I'm going to roll into one because there's not so much time. Then I'll, there are two types, one on, um, our own view on consumption and confidence from Stuart Holland at Equifax. Um, and in a way related to confidence, I think, is, is this question about our Brexit assumptions that's come from Francis Hack at Santander and uh, Catherine Franklin in Denmark. I, I wonder, um, Rory, whether you can tackle those together. Maybe it's a bit of a leap to, to join the two up, but there's this view about you know, how do we arrive at this consumption view? How important is its confidence? and how have our Brexit assumptions changed, if at all, and how is that feeding back to our view on income, consumption and confidence? Rory, can you bundle those up for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I should first of all just clarify our assumptions uh, and beliefs on Brexit have not changed in this um, in this forecast, by which I don't mean to say that we haven't taken on board sort of data <laughs> which, is, which, which have come out since the start of the year, but in terms of our long-term effects of the free trade agreement, they haven't changed in this forecast. They've changed since November 2019, which is um, in that chart which I showed you uh, where, 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 where the lines are effectively lower than they were um, before the COVID pandemic for GDP. Um, 
we in the long term uh, estimate the effect of the free trade agreement to be a negative three and a half percent on UK GDP. That's work going back to um, uh, I think 2018 or 2019 by colleagues here. And we think maybe about half of that had probably happened in the first couple of years after the referendum. So none of that's new in this forecast. Just want to be clear about that. And in terms of the data earlier this year, one of the things we do have um, some analysis by a colleague Manuel in, 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 the, in the UK Economic Outlook, Manuel Kirkland, uh, which talks about trying to disentangle the Brexit effect from the COVID lockdown effect and the stock building unwinding, which was happening in January as well, and some of the difficulty of telling immediately, you know, what's ha what, what happened in January. But our long-term assumptions haven't changed. Um, in terms of the consumption forecast, as I think I said, that is a big source of uncertainty, upside risk and downside risk to GDP and inflation um, in the forecast. We've taken an approach that the, first of all, that household incomes will be a bit stronger than we thought in February because unemployment peaks lower. Uh, earnings growth is relatively, relatively healthy, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and that the savings rate comes down from 16% last year, gradually to around 9%. Now, that could happen more quickly, it could happen more slowly, it could happen to a greater or lesser degree. The, we talked for a long time about Brexit uncertainty. I think Brexit uncertainty is a, certainly at its lowest level so far. That's not to say Brexit is a good, good thing, but uncertainty about the form of Brexit and the effects of Brexit is massively reduced. We also appreciate the policy, policy certainty given by extending the furlough scheme to the autumn. Um, the government seems to have learned from its mistakes last autumn when it announced uh, an extension with five hours notice or something. So in terms of certainty, you know, we expect households to have some to be relatively confident over the next couple of quarters. But relative to what, it's very hard to tell. I mean, you look at how the savings ratio came down after the financial crisis. There may be no guide to now because we weren't talking about forced savings uh, that had accumulated. So um, uh, I wish I could be, um, I wish I could say that we we're absolutely certain about this. There's an enormous amount of uncertainty relating to Brexit and the global COVID picture around that consumption path. Um, but what we've done is we've looked at historical patterns, we've looked at what's happened in the past, and we've looked at what's accumulated over the last year and sort of taken a view where we think it'll go over the next couple of months. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, I appreciate we're running, bundling up a lot of questions and you've done very well to provide an answer, but let me encourage all attendees to just get in touch directly if you have more questions that you <clears throat> want to raise to us and also to give us time to give you an even fuller answer. Um, a number of questions on the labour market. I want to um, throw almost bowl Cyril and over in one, one, one swoop if I can. There's a number of questions, if I can pick them up. We have uh, Jack Spencer from Cambridge on Econometrics who's asking about the lags in unemployment that they typically happen a long time after GDP returns to its level. We've got something happening much more quickly here. Is that specific to this crisis? Uh, Nikki Morgan uh, is asking about shortages of workers in certain areas. How is that structural problem working its way through our analysis of sectors and outcomes? Johannes Gerling at the, at the German embassies is similar, similarly asking about uh, structural issues in in various sectors, as is Bernard Casey. Um, are we ex are we are we thinking that people will be moving jobs more quickly this time than they have in the past? And then finally, with David Cobham of, of Harriet Watt is is asking whether there's any room for changes in the minimum wage to help demand. Now you may not be able to answer those, Cyril, but I just want to say clearly, labour market transitions are key to where the economy is going to go. Can we build better jobs uh, that are going to have higher wages attached to them? Uh, they're going to mean prosperity, or is it back to the same? So, so we'll just pick what you can uh, and answer what you can, but we will certainly respond to these questions um, over time. And they're very good questions. So thank you to you all for them. Cyril. Uh, thank you very much, Jajid. And yes, thank you for, for the question. So, um, I mean, first, I think it's important to, to, to say that there is a, a lot of uncertainty in the labour market. And if you look at, you know, forecast for unemployment, uh, from different forecasters, you know, it's um, they are very different in terms of, of either no wise in unemployment or, or unemployment wise into to six seven percent. Um, 
And um, so, so the reason uh, why you know it's very difficult to forecast is is because of the furlough scheme that has you know sort of it is a structural change to the labour market. And while it's temporary, um, it, it it still has um, you know a big impact. Um, and um, so to, to answer the question about you know uh, are some of those people who are in in the non traded services sector gone to, to immigration? So. Um, I mean, while we don't know exactly the the, the, the exact number of, uh, on um, the exact numbers on employment, and the ONS will um, will sort of revise its population numbers uh, in the summer. Uh, so what we know for sure is the is the people in furlough, um, and and we know there's still you know four and a half million people in furlough, and so this huge stock uh, of of uh, of people you know has to be. Um, either going back to their sector or we allocate it to different sectors, and uh, for sure it will take time, you know, for for people to retrain and 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 for you know those jobs lost in hospitality to go to to something else. And so, why it may there be there will probably be a temporary rise in in vacancy. We expect this the rise the current rise in vacancy to um, six hundred thousand is the latest number. Uh, to, to be really temporary um, as people sort of uh, uh, sort of try and uh, go where um, where they can find jobs uh, at, at the end of, uh, of the period in furlough, um, and so we, that means you know we we sort of strongly encourage the government to 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 help in this sort of building human capital and investing in in uh, in human capital, um, and because that will be key to sort of uh, reducing the, the long term scouring effect. Um, from the pandemic, from um, high unemployment, um, and and in terms of sort of the fact that usually unemployment sort of uh, peaks, you know, two two to three years um, uh, after the end of um, uh, after the beginning of the recession, um, then um, we have reasons to believe that this time it will be different because um, you know when you have activity growing by four and a half percent next year and. And still growing, you know, um, quite quite strongly in in 2023 and uh, uh, 2024. Um, then it's it's sort of difficult to imagine that um, so this this very, very robust uh, rebound in output won't be associated with you know um, uh, employment doing better. So, so so fundamentally, because it's a very temporary shock and and the structure of the shock is a bit different. That's why um, we expect unemployment to peak. Uh, much earlier than in previous recessions. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. Well, sad and difficult though times have been. Um, one encouraging aspect I think we at the Institute have taken from this is, is how it's given us a chance to work together and think through these difficult times and, and try to understand what's going on and provide policy advice, um, policy assessment, uh, and impact for the work of economists and social scientists. Um, as I said right at the beginning, do, do come and participate, either ask questions or work with us if you wish, um, on these key issues. Building back uh, this economy and the global economy is something that uh, may well occupy most of the rest of my career, uh, and in fact for many people on the call. So, so just think about whether you want to um, work with us as well, on some of the issues we're addressing and if so please get in touch to do so um, i've really enjoyed the last hour or so there have been some quite excellent uh, presentations some very engaged questions i wish we had more time with everyone i also hope that before the end of the year uh, we can meet in person at dean trench street and um, have further conversations over coffee and bacon butties beforehand and uh, afterwards as well and that also makes for a wonderful uh, event uh, even though this was as well so thank you all very much for joining. Thank you to Handel and the team uh, for constructing such brilliant analyses that I hope many of you will read and absorb. Uh, but thank you to you particularly for joining us this morning. Um, take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.